Good evening then everybody. This evening we have uh, Professor, after his promotion, Professor yeah, Ed Dorr, um, Professor in Physics at the University of Sheffield. He's worked on many aspects of the dark universe, including searches for two kinds of dark matter, axions and wimps, and the quest for direct detention of gravitational waves with the LIGO instruments, an effort which he joined in 1997. He leads the University of Sheffield Gravitational Wave Research Group, which was a member of the team that announced the first and second direct detention of gravitational waves from black hole binaries. First discoveries were in 2015 for black holes and 2017 for neutron stars. So please put your hands together and welcome Professor Ed Dorr. I was asked to step in at short notice and I have to apologize. A consequence of that is that you might, some of you have seen a few of these slides before, um, but I can't remember what they look like. It's been a few years, so hopefully you'll have forgotten as well. And we can all enjoy them again or um, find mistakes on them again. One of the two, maybe both. Um, so a little bit of history of this, um, my father and mother are both musicians and I had lots of music lessons growing up as well as learning physics and um, ended up kind of a hobbyist playing the piano mostly. I played the cello as well, but that's not quite so useful for this talk. So you won't see the cello. Um, actually, one good thing is that because I'm doing this from home, I can play you my actual real genuine Hammond organ. So I'm going to try and do that a bit later. Um, newly restored it was it was broken until the lockdown and i've sort of spent my time spare time i've got because of the lockdown fixing it so now it actually makes noise which is great so i've got some slides which i'll put up so this is a talk really about machines and for making sound and um of course the old machines for making sound didn't use electronics at all they used vibrating strings and horns and all the rest of it um but I guess in America mostly, in the 50s, 40s, 30s, you know, 19 somethings, there were two different groups of people who wanted to make music um, using instruments they couldn't afford or couldn't get, or both. And one of those groups of musicians was um, people who were Christians or other religions perhaps, and they wanted to do church services in the middle of nowhere. And they couldn't afford a pipe organ. There probably wasn't even an organ builder they could use, even if they had the money, which they didn't. And so there was a market for alternatives to the old-fashioned pipe organ for doing church music. Um, and the other group were people who wanted to play rock and roll and jazz and all those kinds of things. Because when these organs and pianos started coming along, which people invented to fill this void, people realized that they didn't sound exactly like the old instrument, but maybe in some cases they sounded a little bit better and different and exciting. And so people got into making music with these instruments and it was different from the music that was being made with pipe organs and, and pianos. Um, I guess that's the other thing. People wanted pianos in the middle of nowhere too. And the piano is a heavy thing to move around. If, you're, if you've ever done, been in a band that had to move a piano, I have, um, it's not pleasant at the end of the gig to have to put the thing back in the van carrying it down the spiral staircase you got it up at the beginning of the evening never seems quite as easy when you've had a few and you've and it's four in the morning so you know a piano that is more transportable than a piano is another thing that people wanted um but back in the days when they were making these instruments they didn't have electronic tone generators that were any good they had to figure out ways of making a mechanical tone generator which could then be induced into causing an electrical circuit to vibrate which then could get amplified and so the tone generators were the difficult bit people knew how to make an amplifier and they knew how to make a speaker but they didn't necessarily know how to actually generate the sound electrically um, this by the way is a picture of james booker who was um that's when he was very young um booker t and the mgs a sort of iconic um band from from New Orleans. They started out as session musicians. They were just got together to play for people and then they made a tape to, to get work. And that tape was the famous album Green Onions. Some of you might even have Green Onions. It's a classic. But that's James Booker, the organ player in the in the band. My mouse has gone a 
trying to figure out what to do here. Okay, so. So how do you generate tones electronically? Well, one way is by getting a piece of flat metal and sort of twanging it. So you, you, when you're bored at school with your ruler against the desk, you probably did it a few times or a few thousand times, maybe with your ear to the desk so you could hear the sound it made. And, you know, as you move the, the ruler back towards the desk, the tone gets higher because the vibrations get shorter period, higher frequency. Um, of course, a, a ruler is, is a wooden object, so you can't very easily turn that motion into an electrical sound but if you make that out of a steel <coughs> ruler or a, a metal ruler and then you surround that a vibrating flat metal plate with another flat metal surround there's an electrical capacitance between the two plates now it's not as large as it would be if they were one above the other but it'll do it's a capacitance which is probably a few few picofarads and as you as the plate vibrates the capacitance of the arrangement of two plates varies if you have a varying capacitor you can use that to generate a tone um, the circuit up there i guess um isn't quite right because usually there's a resistor in the circuit as well and then you measure the voltage across the resistor and as the capacitance varies the voltage across the resistor varies as well and that's kind of how it works um, so that's a Wurlitzer electric piano. And, and what it consists of is probably 50 or 60 of these flat plates um, vibrating, surrounded by another flat plate, which doesn't vibrate. And then there'll be um, some kind of a, a circuit which combines all the notes and a mixer or, or an adding circuit. And then there's a single output. And then that output goes into an amplifier. So on this, this instrument here that I've got below me, um, it's the same one I bought. It's the same one I bought to, the, to, your, to your society when I did this in person. And it's got a recorded Wurlitzer sound in it, which I'm going to try and play. Hang on. Too long. Oh, I like jazz and blues. So most of my music is, I hope you like it too, because you're going to hear a lot of it, I think. Um, so this is a Wurlitzer sound. things about a Wurlitzer is that it's got volume control because obviously the harder you hit the key it's like a piano mechanism with a hammer when the hammer strikes 
the vibrating metal the harder it's going to have more of a vibration but also if you drive very hard by hitting it very hard the shape of the metal plate will it'll flap around just like an ordinary ruler would if you really whacked it and that flapping generates harmonics which gives you some attack on the notes so if you hit it harder you get a different tone so you get this nice sort of for blues it's really nice you can do this kind of thing it's not completely flat like an organ sound So that's the world it's so that's one type of electromechanical piano and um and not to be honest they're a little bit lighter and smaller than a piano but not all that much it still weighs about 120 pounds it's pretty difficult to get it up the stairs because it's full of got a lot of metal in it but better than a piano Ed, um, can i just ask yeah. you to tip your camera because we're losing the bottom of your face off the bottom of your screen okay. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Right. Okay. So now I'm having trouble figuring out how to make this. You've got to talk into your microphone. Right. So this thing here, you're familiar with this. This is a tuning fork um, used to tune pianos, guitars, violins, whatever else. And obviously this is another sort of a glorified ruler, really. Um, now the question is, can you use this to make a sound which can be detected and turned into an electrical signal and the answer is yes you can and then you this uses the, the classic um, mechanical to electrical, sig electrical signal device which is the pickup now they're in all electric guitars um, and they're also in um, Rhodes pianos which is an extra instrument I'm going to talk about um, and um, they're, 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 they're quite a simple device but they're not quite as simple as you might think that there's a sort of a two-step process so the first thing is the vibrating object or the oscillating object that's making the the, the, the vibration or oscillation that's going to be your going to be your tone you hear isn't usually itself magnetic right so guitar strings are not magnetic and tuning forks aren't magnetic on the other hand they could be made out of steel or some other material which can be magnetized so what a pickup consists of is it consists of a permanent magnet which has a coil of wire wrapped around it. So the, the way it works is the permanent magnet induces magnetism in your vibrating string or tuning fork. So that becomes a magnet, but only because the permanent magnet's sitting next to it. And then once you have a vibrating magnet, that generates an oscillating electromagnetic field. And if you have a coil in that oscillating field, that coil will get an oscillating electromagnetic a voltage across it because of Faraday's law of induction. So it's a two-step thing. You have to make your vibrating object magnetic, and that's what the permanent magnet's for. And then you have to place a coil somewhere in the vicinity so that when it's vibrating and it's magnetic, you get this oscillating electromagnetic field, and that gives rise to your oscillating voltage and therefore current in the wire, and you can amplify that and make a noise. So the um, Fender Rhodes piano, invented by a man called Rhodes, and I guess marketed by Fender, who also make guitars, of course, 
um, there's Mr. Harold Rhodes um, with one of his instruments, and there's the Rhodes piano. It actually looks very similar to a well, it's the stage piano, very similar size, similar style as well. It makes a somewhat different sound, um, which I'll play. There's a couple of different ones in here. I'll, I'll use one of the slightly twangier ones. Um, but it makes this really nice sort of soft, mellow sound, which is really good for jazz. It's a little bit of um, a Fender Rhodes sound. Um, I've carried a fair few of those around gigs as well. A friend of mine called Jim Deschler in Boston used to have one. Um, yeah, they're not very light either. Um, so, um, so that's the pianos, and it's, it's, it shares a feature with the the, um, the world. It's a piano, which is kind of, kind of an obvious thing. Which is again, it's it's velocity sensitive. There's a natural connection between how heavily or fast you strike the note and, and the volume of the sound which as a musician that's very useful now if you play the organ church organ pipe organ you, you don't have that luxury because the, the tone generator in organ is a very different type so you know how an organ works you basically have a well the old-fashioned ones you had a, a choir boy with bellows and um, they pump 
air into an upturned metal object is a bit like a small version of a modern gasometer. Basically, once you have air in this upturned bucket in a, in a water sealed vessel, the weight of the bucket pushes down and provides a pressure regulation. So that, that means that the pressure built up in the system remains fairly static. You know, even if the choir boy takes a break for a few, a few seconds, you're not going to lose all the pressure. So once you've got that head of pressure, you can direct that through pipes and pipes with reeds in and, and other things. And you, and you basically have a valve which is operated by your key. So when you press the key down, it opens the valve and you get the note. And it's as simple as that. But that means you have no control over the volume at all. So the only way you can control the volume is by controlling what stops the sound is going through. So if you want to make it louder, you just have to pull out more stops. And since it's hard to do that when you're in the middle of playing the hymn or whatever it is, then there's generally more than one manual on the organ so that you can just switch to a different manual or play one manual with one hand and one with the other, and you get tonal variation that way. And so it's amazing to me that the church organ has been around as long as it has, because when you think about how complicated the things are, it's an absolute wonder that they, that they were invented and you know Bach used to play them in, in the 1500s and they were around a long time before that. So how that engineering got done at that early stage and how they figured out all that stuff is it's quite miraculous. But um, it's a big heavy thing, a pipe organ. So how are we gonna turn that into something that you can cart around and then enter, enter the famous Mr. Hammond. Um, and so he had this idea, which is that if you take your guitar pickup, it's actually the same as we were using with the, with the Rhodes piano. And instead of having a vibrating string next to the end of it or a vibrating tuning fork, we just have a sort of a cog made of a magnetizable metal like steel and it looks it looks literally like the, the gear out of the gearbox perhaps the teeth don't have to be as sharp because they're not going to mesh with any other teeth all they're doing is providing a metal surface whose magnetized end has a varying distance from the coil of wire and so as that as the distance of the end of, of the circumference of that tone wheel from the pickup oscillates you get an induced current in, in the coil. And the frequency of the note is set by the velocity of rotation of the, of the axle, which in a Hammond organ is driven by a synchronous motor, which means in, in the UK, um, it goes at some multiple of 50 cycles a second, depending on how many sets of windings the motor has. And I don't actually know that. I haven't actually ever looked at the thing. Um, so it may well just be 50 cycles a second. And um, the other thing that determines the frequency is the number of teeth per turn. So if you, you can have a single tone wheel driving multiple notes, all you have to have is lots of cogs strung on the axis. Um, and it's, it's actually even better than that, because if you want to generate a note with a rich harmonic content, you don't just need the frequency, let's say middle C, you also need to mix in a, a bit of the double frequency or the first overtone of that, which is, well, if this is middle C, then, then the first overtone is there. It's an octave above, and that's, got, that's just twice as many teeth on the cog when you think about it. So you just have another cog which sits next to this one with double the teeth. Now, if you have triple the teeth, you get the second overtone, which is actually the fifth. And then if you have four times the teeth, you get these tones. And then five times is up here. Six times is up there. And seven times... It's actually the blue note. This is why the blues sounds so good to your ear because you're actually listening to one of the quite low overtones of a fundamental when you hear the blue, the blue seventh note. It's actually a more natural part of the scale than the major seventh, which kind of jars in your ear a little bit because it's it's a much higher harmonic than the than the, than the um, minor seventh. At least that's my theory. Anyway, so um, so you, you can use these tone wheels to generate generate all these overtones at once and then you want to produce an actual sound from them so what you do is you mix them together so if you've ever played with a, a Hammond organ here's a picture of one with Lawrence Hammond um, I'll show you a real one in a minute because I've got one over here but I've got to move the microphone for that so um, that's going to cause disruptions I'm going to talk a little bit first um, and so you can see this one's got pedal board and two manuals, which is the usual. And if you look carefully above the top keyboard, there's a bunch of what look like little dots. Well, they're not actually dots, they're draw bars. You can pull them out and push them in. And pulling them out and pushing them in varies the 
the resistance of the variable resistor and that controls the contribution that that overtone for each of the notes makes to the overall sound. So you can literally build a sound out of its harmonics. So in a sense, it's a synthesizer. You synthesize a sound out of harmonics. Um, and it, it's a really cool instrument and it's totally electromechanical. And I've got one over here and I'll play, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. It's not as fancy as that one. The one you see there, um, actually it's, it's probably a Hammond B3 or it might be, it actually might be a C3. So I actually only learned this recently. So Hammond produced two models which were intended for commercial venues. Um, C stood for church. So the C3 was designed to be in churches. The B3, B actually stood for brothel because the, the other application of Hammond organs was houses of ill repute, blues bars, rock and roll bands. And so the, the C3 had a very plain case without much decoration. The B3 was quite decorated and sort of luxuriant looking. I guess they were for different markets, but it was exactly the same um, circuitry inside. So I'll get mine fired up if you would just bear with me. I've, it, it's kind of a beast. It's got a starter motor in it, like a car. So, so you, you have to start it. The starter motor gets everything going. And then you turn the starter motor off and the main synchronous motor takes over. It doesn't have to talk to start the thing up, but it can keep it going once it's started. And that the starter motor makes a terrible racket. And then once you stop it, you, you, it's, it's a bit more peaceful. So give me a minute, I'll get it started. Uh, it's full of valves as well. So the valves have to warm up. Um, it, it's almost all valve. The only, the only silicon in it is there's some rectifier diodes in the power supply. In the later models, they replaced a big rectifier valve that was in the earlier models with silicon diodes because they're just so much more efficient. But all of the amplification circuitry is, um, is um, it's making a horrible noise. I hope that means it isn't, doesn't mean it's broken. Let me try it. Hang on. All right, so that's the flat Hammond sound. Now, um, I'll, I'll move some of the draw bars. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll kill them all except the very low harmonics and you can hear it. So it gets, gets very flat. You do that, so let's turn off all these high harmonics. We just need the bottom couple in. That's, that's the pure Hammond sound. far from over because the next thing is that's a pretty flat sound I mean the tonal quality is flat you get the same sound at the beginning of the note as you get at the end and um, that's true in a, a pipe organ too and if you want to spruce it up a little bit you can add what's called a percussion circuit so this is a valve circuit that's designed to produce a sharp click at the beginning of the note so there's various percussion circuits built into Hammond's if I turn them all on, this top manual here has got those percussion circuits enabled, the bottom manual doesn't. So you hear without them, it's very flat. But with them, you get this nice sharp start to note.
okay? So that's, that's again, still kind of a flat Hammond sound. Um, and even that, that sort of jazzy kind of sound, but with really flat tones is, is in quite a lot of music. You'll hear it in, um, in different, different kinds of music, some gospel sounds, but the, the real Hammond sound comes from the one that's kind of archetypal is the kind of swirly kind of sound that you get. And that's from combining the Hammond with another device, which is another electromechanical device developed by a chap called, um, got all this, called Leslie. Now I've forgotten his first name. Um, and Hammond and Leslie didn't get along. He was another engineer. They, they, they had a sort of feud throughout their lives as scientists sometimes do, as you know. Um, some astronomers were famous for this as well. You probably know the stories about astronomy, astronomical fights over credit for things. Um, I'm afraid scientists sometimes have fragile egos. It's a bit of a shame. But anyway, so, so Leslie's concept was to try and um, make the sound from these electronic organs, which were being produced not just by Hammond, but by others. I think Wurlitzer also made a stage organ, which got quite famous for being in cinemas. They'd be big Wurlitzer organs in seminars. Um, but to make the sound a bit more interesting, what he did is he mounted the speaker facing downwards. So you see on this slide, there's a big bass driver. It's probably a cardboard coned 18 inch driver, but facing downwards into what looks like a, a black box. And what that black box actually is, is it's a cylindrical box and the black material you see is just fabric. So it's acoustically fairly transparent. And what's in the box is just a piece of plywood at 45 degrees. So it reflects the sound from the bass driver out into the room, but it doesn't end there because the whole thing is driven by a motor and it rotates. So as it rotates, the baffle, the 45 degree baffle rotates around and it projects the sound out in different directions. And when you turn that thing on, you get this, um, you get this kind of swirly effect. Now I've got a Leslie, um, I, I can show it to you. That thing in the corner of the room that looks like a big box, it's got a drum on top of it at the moment. But if you take that back, the back of that box off, you see pretty much exactly what's in this picture, because I think it's even the same model. So when I turn that on, you'll be able to hear the classic hand sound, which people kind of know. So let me do that. I'll, I'll put the mic next to the Leslie for a minute so you can hear it. Uh, that's going to do it. So I'll turn my Leslie on. There's a switch on the keyboard that activates it. Here it gets started. <laughs> Now, I refuse to bring my Hammond organ to the um, Working Man's Club in Maxborough, so this lockdown has brought to you something you wouldn't normally hear, because I'm not bringing that thing out. It weighs about 200 pounds. I've, they only just succeeded in making it more portable than an organ. Now, I have to get a piano mover every time I want to shift it. Um, so, you know, pretty soon after all these instruments um, came in, and got popular and you know the Beach Boys, the Green Indians, all the jazz people used them. Um, uh, REM actually used a lot of Hammond. Um, other instruments came and, and sort of got lighter and smaller and synthesizers had their day you know starting in the 70s and then the 80s and 90s were all synthesizers and samplers and 
it's actually one of the things about these instruments which is magical is even though there are a lot of trouble like i actually have to oil this thing um and um and you know they're quite high maintenance they're not particularly easy to keep going they still get played you still see musicians playing the genuine hammond organ or the rhodes piano at gigs in in 2018 if you go out listen to that kind of music you'll still see these things in clubs and you'll still hear them getting played because they're great instruments to play they, they have a wonderful sort of liveliness to them and, and as a musician playing them you can feel the energy and they, they also smell really good because all the sort of moving parts you can kind of smell the oil and the sort of the, the, the mechanicalness of it all there's a sort of magic about them i really like them and they've they'll last you know because they're they're a piece of our music heritage now so i find them very interesting and i hope you do too and that's why i give this talk um and of course we can i'm lucky i've got this keyboard that makes some of the sounds for me so i don't have to buy them all because i don't think my wife wants me to own any more pianos I've, I've got enough and i had to negotiate pretty hard to be allowed to keep the hammond to be honest um but you know so i don't think i'm going to get any more i think i'm going to rely on my my little sampler box now for, for most of the sounds so anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you very much for that. What I'm going to do um, is, I've got to say, I've, I've run off here. Uh, have you finished, Ed? Well, uh, it's, there's, a, there's some more stuff I could talk about. I mean, I, f I feel like I, I, could go, I could talk a bit about um, some other electromechanical things um, which, which, which have been made, which are quite interesting. Um, but maybe... You know, I'll, I will. I will just mention one more thing, which is that the the other thing that you need when you're doing music with these kinds of instruments is often you're trying to play in quite a small room, um, but you want to sound like you're in a big room, um, or you maybe you want the vocalist to sound like they're in a big room because it makes their voice sound better, and and so you need some kind of way of generating echo or reverberation. And that's quite an art form as well. And you can bet that there were no circuits that would do that either um, at the time. There are now, you can now buy digital reverb units, do a great job, and they'll even replicate the echo of particular rooms around the world. You know, if you buy a nice expensive digital reverb, it'll, it'll, it'll replicate the echo in the Vatican or the studio that Blue Note have for recording or pretty much whatever you want. But they didn't always have those things. And the way they did it, Back in the day and there's a couple of units in the back of this hammond that do exactly the same thing they're called a spring line reverb so what that consists of is metal springs i hope i've got a picture of one maybe i do yeah here's one so you can see this one's folded actually they're not all folded some of them are straight but the idea is you have a a magnet and a coil at one end and another coil and a magnet at the other end and at one end you drive the magnet with the coil so you have an amplifier which puts a copy of the sound you want to add reverb to in at one end and it jiggles one end of the spring and then sound travels up the spring because of the vibration of the spring and it gets to the other end and whatever gets to the other end is then converted back into a current because the magnet vibrates and it gets picked up by the coil but of course because it's a spring just like an ordinary room it has all kinds of modes by which the sound can leave the fundamental signal shape that started out and it can it can get there's dispersion and multiple reflections just like there are in a real room and that's what reverb is and so at the other end of this unit when you pick it up you've added a whole bunch of reverberation and so you, you know you're dealing with an amplifier that has a built-in spring line if you ever try to move it when it's on because when you move it what will typically happen is the spring will go Crang! it's horrible noise and that's the spring line reverb complaining about being moved they don't much like to be moved with the power on um, so that's another piece of electromechanical equipment that's in the back of a hammond there's a couple of them in the hammond actually because there's two different reverb circuits i think you can have reverb or more reverb you can you can turn one or both the circuits on and one of them in that hammond is actually faulty because when i turned it on just now i could hear some open circuit noise so i think i've got some problems with one of the cables but the other one's working so that's a spring line reverb um, Right, Ed, I'm getting uh, some messages up for you on uh, on my screen. Um, oh, okay, well that's good because I'm running out of things to say. The, the talk seems to have got shorter. Maybe I give it more quickly when I'm 
when I'm doing it on Zoom, but maybe that's a good thing because Zoom talks, if they drag on, they can get pretty hard to listen to. So maybe it's not too bad. <laughs> well, I think every, from the comments that I can see, everybody's enjoying it. Uh, but uh, I've got, uh, before we go on to questions, I've had a, a request that you do, you play a couple of your favorites. And, My favorites, right, okay. And uh, from one of, one of our members who is a musician, uh, he said, can you play Sylvia? Now, I don't know. Oh man, I wish I wish I knew it. I'm afraid I'm not very good at requests, and and Sylvia is not one I'm familiar with. Oh well, um, you'll have to you'll have to forego that pleasure then. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Up to you, Ed. I'm sorry. All right. Well, I've been trying to learn this kind of Latin thing, so maybe I'll I'll try and play this. It's it's kind of a complicated bass, but I've just sort of been trying to learn it. I I, I think it's kind of fun, so I'll play it to you. Um, all right. Hang on a minute. my attempt at bossa nova rhythm which i've been trying to learn because you know i've got time now because i'm at home i can't go to work very much it sounded excellent ed uh, could i ask you to stop sharing your uh, screen yeah absolutely and then uh, we can get questions from everybody all right hang on a minute I've got to find the stupid mouse it's got, got lost somehow Oh yeah, so that's that's a picture of a um of an electronic Hammond organ made by the same company that makes my keyboard actually. Right, hang on, I've stopped sharing now, so you won't be able to see that. Right, anymore. so we're back on to uh, full screen. Uh, as I ask for questions, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you to put your hand up, and uh, I'll nominate you. Don't forget to turn off. Uh, sorry, to turn your uh, microphone back on. So I know that uh, Chris Hudson Lee uh, wants to ask the first question. So where are you, Chris? Uh, I'm here. Okay. So do you want to fire away? Yeah. Is it about stage two or stage three that you're playing? The this keyboard? is stage two. No, the stage ah, three right. wasn't out when I bought mine. <laughs> ah, I used to be in a band with a guy who played an odd stage two. Um, he had a lot of problems with his tracking, actually. Yeah, they're great. So, yeah. You see them a lot, actually, if you look, yeah. whenever you see those shows that I try never to watch, like American Idol and these kinds of things, the road musician they hired to play behind all the people's invariably playing one of these things, they're, they're absolute workhorses. 
you know, they, 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 all the pros use them because they sound great. They've got lots of good sounds. And if you don't like them, you can download more sounds for them. It's basically a computer with a keyboard in front of it. And the people who make them at Nord, they, they know what they're doing. It's a fan. I actually once took it apart because I needed to fix something inside it. And it's amazing inside. It's just one circuit board about this big. 3,500 quid, you get a circuit board about the size of a book. Um, but it's covered, it's full of dis digital signal processing chips, just DSP chips, obviously running some proprietary program that they've got for all the samples. Very, very well designed thing. Okay, has anybody else got a question? Raise your arm, wave it at me so I can see what's happening. Uh, whilst you're thinking of a question, uh, Ed, it strikes me that um, your keyboard can reproduce the sound of so many other instruments, other organs. Uh, how does that translate to other instruments and and by that I mean a lot of the classical music that we listen to now uh, we hear being played on modern instruments yeah and you've got the ability to recreate the sound of the instrument uh, that that piece of music was written for yeah but it only goes so far because the you know if you try to make the same sound as a guitar or a violin or a cello on a piano keyboard, you're limited by the format of what your fingers can do with the keys. You know, I, I, you, you can't really do a glissando on a, on a piano, whereas on a, on a clarinet, you can do a beautiful one, and, and, and certainly on a cello or a trombone. So music isn't all about the sound, it's also about the interface between your musician and the sound. And a keyboard's actually reasonably limited in some ways. I mean, in other ways, it's wonderful. So, you know, great thing about keyboard is you can play big chords. By doing that on a violin, right? But on the other hand, on a violin, you can make these glorious, glorious shrieks and wails. And it's such an emotional sounding instrument. And of course, if it's played badly, it can drive you insane. Um, <laughs> as, as with all musical instruments, but the violin gets a particularly bad rap for that, along with the accordion, I guess. But, but, but you know, it's not just about the sound. It's also about the musician's ability to control the sound and that's got down to the physical interface and the keyboard is actually in some ways quite a limited interface. That said, if you've got a good keyboard and good software and your object is to recreate the sound of a symphony and you have the score in front of you and good enough music and enough time, you can do a pretty good job. You can fool most people that they're hearing an orchestra, um, but it takes probably weeks to put something like that together. Um, to, and do it really well. Okay. Has anybody got any other questions? Well, give me time. Uh, John. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Uh, Ed, that, that was wonderful. Uh, that made a great change. Uh, really nice to, to hear. Not, um, no, no, not a word of astronomy in the entire thing. Listen, I'm just very new to astronomy. Uh, <laughs> I think I know a little bit more about music than I do astronomy. Um, worry, then. What's what's the main difference between this and, and a synthesizer? Um, uh, I mean, the tone generation. So a synthesizer, you actually the the, the, the secrets in the name. You actually generate the waveform electronically. Right. So the, er the early ones used the same oscillators I have in the lab. Right. So I have a sine wave generator, a triangle generator, and a square wave generator, and those were the oscillators used in the early synthesizers. And then right, later yes. on, they went to a thing called FM synthesis. I'm not exactly sure what the basis of that is, but it produces a lot of the sort of sweepy, stringy sounds that you heard in 1980s music. Yeah. Um, and there's also wavetable synthesis. So basically, the idea is to start with more sophisticated waveforms than just your triangle, your square, and your, and your sine wave and sawtooth. Yeah. But, you know, that, that's the difference. The synthesizer tries to synthesize the sound. Um, as opposed to an electromechanical keyboard, which there's, there is a tone generator that's not electronic. Yes. And a sampler, which is a different thing. That's, that's what this is. It's a recording device, basically. I, I mean, the, the, the sort of blues and the jazz sort of thing you can get from this is, is, is incredible. Um, we, we all know uh, Rick Waitman, and he sort of mentioned back in the 80s, and Rick obviously used keyboards and synthesizers a lot. But it, but it yeah. was never one for for looking at sort of blues and jazz, which was a great shame. 
Um, right. And th this is, I have really enjoyed listening to this. Um, oh, thanks. It's been a real bonus. Playing it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're just going to uh, have one more round and see if uh, anybody's got a, another question. Can you just wave at the screen if you want to ask a question? Give me a moment while I just flick through everybody's image. Well, Ed, if the, if the professorship doesn't work out at Sheffield, I'm sure you're going to uh. get some work at bar mitzvahs and christenings and weddings. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't know, it may come to that with the coronavirus, but actually I'm probably okay because I've given you my Axion talk before, right? And I think I always said at the end of the talk, well, maybe I've only given it once, but one thing I always used to have to say at the end of the talk is, well, it's great doing Axions, but the UK um, funding agency support for Axion research is zero. And so I, I give the talk in the sort of hope that I'll drum up enough interest among the public that eventually the UK government will see fit to give us some money to, to join in the fund. Now, I did my Axion research in the US. It turns out that the UK is now interested in Axion research. So I, I can come back and talk to you about that another time. But it looks as if, and, and I can't say exactly what at the moment, because we're still in the process of, of figuring out what they've actually given us, but they've given us something. So we're going to be able to do some Axion research at Sheffield. And of course, that's good for my job security because I'm bringing in money, which, as you know, is a good thing to do at a university. That's so I won't have to go to do weddings and bar mitzvahs anytime soon. What a relief. <laughs> that's excellent to know that you're going to be visiting us for many years to come. So, oh, ladies and gentlemen, can we uh, just say thanks to Ed for an excellent talk in our usual manner? Yay, well, that's much better than everybody trying to clap into Zoom at once. Yeah, I like it. Very good. Okay. Well, thanks. You're my favorite astronomy society, so I'm glad you're still meeting and I'm glad to be able to do this talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>